had a, a, an interesting conversation with Jennifer. Y'all remember Jennifer, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, she told us she was over there in the North Carolina in that whole thing that was going on and the stories that were happening and um, some of the things that the FEMA was doing after all the food supplies and everything came on site and then FEMA was locking it down and distributing it to nobody. Uh, and so there was another man that came on scene. He was uh, actually um, a hostage negotiator. He was special forces. And he took over the scene and started getting everything distributed. He cut the cables, told FEMA, you can join us or you can be against us, but there's a 200-man militia army, and I've got 6,500 soldiers at my command. So if you want to try to stand up against us, you can. You can either join with us or you can step to the side. And all the FEMA agents came forward except for three of them. They stayed and did not join, but then the food started getting distributed to that. So... The word that I've got for you this morning is, is a word fit for the times, and it's really the antidote to a lot of things that, that are going to be coming our way. But I want to start with this one. Uh, Karen, are you going to read that for us? Okay. Uh, on the fear of the Lord. Um, you've got your copy. i got mine. Okay. I'm going to make sure you read it right. <laughs> oh, and the Lord added this. Okay. All right. Go ahead and read it. Um, um, no, this, yeah. Here. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. So I was studying the fear of the Lord and um, got this from Unger's Bible Dictionary. And um, fear is the affection of the mind which arises on the conception of approaching danger. The fear of God is of several kinds. Superstitious, which is the fruit of ignorance. Servile, which leads to the abstinence from many sins through apprehension of punishment and filial, which has its spring in love, and prompts to care not to offend God and to endeavor in all things to please Him. It is another term for practical piety and comprehends the virtues of the godly character outlined in Psalm 111, 10, Proverbs 14, 2, while its absence is characteristics of a wicked and depraved person according to Romans 3.18. It is produced in the soul by the Holy Spirit, and great blessing is pronounced upon those who possess this Christian trait. Those things are his angels protect him, and they are under the shadow of the Almighty. This fear will subsist in a pious soul if there were no punishment for sin. It dreads God's displeasure, desires his favor, reveres his holiness, submits cheerfully to his will, is grateful for his benefits, sincerely worships him, and conscientiously obeys his commands. Fear and love must coexist in us in order that either passion may be healthy and that we may please God and rightly serve Him. The fear of the Lord is used for the worship of God. In other words, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And uh, referred again in, uh, the, uh, as the fear of Isaac, who is um, the God who Isaac worshipped in reverent awe. Then it went on to say, the fear of man is that dread of the opinions of our neighbors, which makes us cowards in the performance of those duties we fancy and do not practice. And then yesterday, the Lord just added to that, He said, the enemy presents a counterfeit to the fear of the Lord and camouflages it in self-righteousness and self-justification. And because it is so subtle, a practitioner in this counterfeit exhibits an appearance of holiness and presents themselves as something they are not, thus engaging in a form of idolatry that glorifies the devil rather than God. And he said, this is also a spirit of hypocrisy and defines how, how the church treats the fear of the Lord. Rather than holy reverence, 
It is treated as something to be practiced or demonstrated in a church service only. Outside of church, there is no true consideration or reverence. The challenge to the church is to be the church, not in thought, word, deed, or duty, but in holy and intimate relationship with the creator of the universe, in the person of his triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as the branches attached to the vine, yielding to the hand of the vine dresser. Amen, amen, amen. One of the things that we're going to see that is going to permeate the body of Christ coming is this dualism of the love of God and the fear of God at the same time. And that deep, deep reverence that we have for the Lord, that we're supposed to have for God. The interesting thing is that you can love God and not fear God. Isn't that strange? But when you both love and fear the Lord, and, and this word fear means to have... Uh, a reverential, awesome, holy respect for God. The Lord says that on this one I will look on him who has a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. And if we had a glimpse, like John did in Revelation, of the throne of God, if we had a glimpse of that, as Don, he just fell onto his feet and the Lord had to revive him. This was the same John who leaned on the shoulder of Jesus, the beloved the one that loved Christ with such passion, it was this same John that saw Christ in his glory and just fell at his feet and just like was passed out. He was taken over and the Lord had to revive him to stand him to his feet. I think that the Lord would have to feed us doses of this, of who he is, that if he were to suddenly unveil himself, we would all just be slayed out, knocked out cold. Our ability to be able to, to receive and to, and to understand and conceptualize God is based upon our love for the Lord and our concepts and understanding of who He is. It's something that we grow into the, that graduated state before God. It's not something you just suddenly, bam, you're there. This is the maturing of the saints. So this understatement of our, of our greatest weapon, as I've said, the Bible is a complete understatement. Everything about the Bible is an understatement. I've used the place where, you know, um, Christ fasted 40 days and then he was hungry. Hmm. Try fasting in 40 days and see if you, how you would describe that. It would not say, I was hungry. Everything, everything is an understatement in, in that. We, sin is an understatement. Holiness is an understatement. Everything's an understatement. And I think that the Lord says the simplicity of the truth is enough you don't have to have elaborations and deepening of those things to believe the truth. So believe the truth for simply what it is. Psalm 119, 20, 125 says, I'm your servant. Give me understanding and ability to learn and a teachable heart that I may know your word. And that is actually the word it would be in the Hebrew, but it would be in the equivalent of the Greek. It would be the logos to understand God's word. Now, we're looking at some pretty testy times coming up. You've heard me say that. It was interesting. I was looking back at the book that I had written some 10 years ago on the chronological order of the end times. And, and uh, lo and behold, in that, I have a chapter dedicated to one, not a chapter, but a whole paragraph on page dedicated to what's happening right now, that Israel would attack Iran. I said that in the book 10 years ago, what was happening. Now, I don't want to call that at the time I wrote it. I wouldn't confidently say that it was prophecy as more than it was actually predictive based upon the current trends of things as I was seeing them. But we're starting to see some things happening that at such a fast accelerated rate that you and I cannot keep up with it. Um, it's going to take the sovereignty of God that Donald Trump will be in office. It's going to take the sovereignty. The, the, it's a razor thin line between the depotisms of darkness that are staging up against the righteous. And I'm, I'm sad to say the righteous is more lazy than the aggression of the, of the, of the darkness. And we are too complacent, too lethargic, you know, too just we hand it over to God and don't do anything when the Lord is enlisting us and saying, do something. Get on your knees and pray. Go out there and do the thing that you do have power to persuade. Exercise your vote. That's what the things that we can do. But unfortunately, there's more conservatives that don't vote than there are, liberal, than there are liberals that do vote. 
So we need to change that. We need to pray. But if he comes in, then it's going to be by the sovereignty of God and his plan and his timing of the things that are going to take place. Amen. Amen. If this does not happen and it's predictive, I believe in my heart that it will. But as I said, going to be, it's going to take the sovereignty of God to do this. Nonetheless, we need to be ready for things. Amen. Okay, so with that in mind and the things that are about ready to happen, what would be the thing that you and I need to stand on? Now, I want to throw a few things on the corner to you about this. And number one is that there's a lot of stuff that's going to be hurling at you out there. A lot of different things, a lot of predictions, a lot of false fronts, a lot of fear fronts that are going to be hur hurling toward you. What you need to remember is a couple of particulars. Number one, God never isolates, except in the Old Testament he did, because that was the mode of communication. But today, every one of us in the body of Christ have the Holy Spirit in us. In the Old Testament, they did not. They relied upon the voice of the prophet. And there would be prophets that would speak directly to the king, and these things would be written down and they would be broadcast. In the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit within us. His Spirit witnessing to our spirit. That we may not be alarmed, but that we may hear the voice of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. So when things get hurled at you, the first thing you want to do is this coming from one source. Is it coming from the exclusive voice of one person or two? You want, when the Lord does something, he, he pluralizes his voice through his leaders into the body of Christ. God's not going to do anything unless he speaks it to his prophets first. So what is the concert of the prophets saying? That's what we want to listen to. Does that witness to your spirit? Because we also know there's a lot of false prophets that are out there. And they're going to be saying things that are a shade line different than what the true prophets are saying. But just enough error in it to make it dangerous. So we want to know what God is saying to us. Amen. Now we do know this in Scripture. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now let me go back. The day of the Lord is a bracket of time that starts at the sixth seal, which is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and which is the rapture of the church, okay? Before the wrath of God begins. Okay, so, so the day of the Lord starts there, but the day of the Lord continues all the way to the seventh seal. It's not a day of the Lord. The day of the Lord means this is the time now when God moves, if I can put it that way. Okay, so he's talking about the day of the Lord has come, meaning did Jesus come and leave us behind? And now all this chaos is happening because in their day... The Christians were being wrapped up in, in animal skins. They were being dipped in tar. They were being, you know, skewered through poles. And Nero was calling them as human torches. They were used as entertainment in the Colosseums. That was in the day that Paul was writing this, by the way, of the persecution that was coming onto the church. So they thought that they had been left behind. And so he reminds them, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness, which is Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction. Now you have an order there that he's talking about. First the apostasy, then Antichrist is revealed. And then number four, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now that takes place at the fourth seal. Seals one through three are the white, red, and black horses. But when you go to the fourth seal, that's the ashen horse. That's when Antichrist goes into the temple and... Two out of three Jews are killed on the streets according to the prophecy of Zechariah. And then he goes in and puts him, sits down in the temple and declares himself to be God. The false prophet debuts at that time and calls fire down from heaven to prove his spiritual authority and says, This is God. Everybody take his mark and make an image and worship him. Now that's what he's talking about right here in the fourth verse. Okay, we have that disclosure in Revelation is what's happening. So look what goes on. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Now, listen, you will hear this over and over again, but the thing that we, you and I need to remember is something that's very, very in our face right now. So what comes first? 
It's the apostasy that comes first, okay? The apostasy takes place first. That's what he said. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. What's the apostasy and what does that look like? That's what we want to talk about a little bit here this morning. Not all of that, but some of the things. Okay. So the understatement of our greatest preservation, and we're going to get into that, is the thing that's going to keep us in the apostasy. So the apostasy is this. Listen carefully. It is a graduated falling away by almost imperceptible degrees. Okay? Just almost imperceptible degrees. It's kind of a half a step here, then a half a step there. And then, you know, the person before you know it, there's taking another half a step, and then another half a step. And then they linger for a while, then they take another half a step. Before you know it, they're off center. Okay, and they're in this sustained position, but they're drifting further and further and further away in almost imperceptible, seductive degrees that have no alarm per step. Okay, follow me on that one. No alarm per step. Okay, keep that in mind, okay? Now we're going to look what this apostasy, what it does, what it kind of represents as, all right? So in the apostasy of the Lord Jesus Christ that, we're, that this word talks about, let's look at, at how much time you've got right now. If a thousand years is compared to a day and a day is a thousand years, and you're looking at that ratio, God's view, a thousand years is a day. Jesus only died 60 hours ago. He was only crucified 60 hours ago on a ratio of a thousand years as a day. Now you stop and you think about this, okay? From the perspective of God looking at his timetable versus us looking upward at years, months, seconds, days, the increments of time, okay? Adam lived six days ago. Okay, so when you're looking at these things, look at this. The end times, which is a total of 2,595 days, starting from the first seal to the first day of the millennium, is only four hours in duration. So the whole end time thing, in God's eyes, only takes four hours to do. It's pretty crazy, because we're looking at over 2,595 days. Look at this, though. This is another interesting point of view here. Okay? If you're 80 years old, if you live to be 80, the total span of your life is equal to about 46 minutes in the eyes of God. Okay? Now, you've got 46 minutes to accumulate all of your blessings, all of your rewards, and to walk in righteousness before God. You have 46 minutes. Isn't it true that the scripture says that our life is like, like, like dust, like a vapor? That's what it says in Psalm 103. So now you understand that when he's looking like this, we have a hard time understanding God from that point of view of a thousand years as a day. So an 80-year-old man will live about 46 minutes. If you're 40 years old, you'll live 23 minutes. Now this is at the time that Christ comes, okay? Because you're not going to live 80 years. Most people aren't going to live 80 years before Jesus gets here. So if you're 40 years old when Christ gets here, you'll have only lived 23 minutes. Everything you're going to do in this life is going to have to be accomplished in 23 minutes. Okay? Now, do you have time to waste? No. Okay. You have time to mis misalign your focus? You have time to be entangled into the things of this world and miss the primary thing, of a, which is an eternity? You're going to trade 23 minutes for an eternity. But what you do in that 23 minutes has a great bearing as to the blessings that you're going to carry the rest of eternity in rewards. Amen. Okay, look at this. In 20, if you're 20 years old, you'll live in 11 and a half minutes. Okay, I, I don't know about you, but I'm panicked at 46 minutes. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> at 23 minutes, I can't even get my shoes on in that time period. Babylon, which Revelation in chapter 18 describes as destroyed in one hour, is actually destroyed in the eyes of God in 23 hundredths of a second. <laughs> it's just like, that's all the religious and all the commercial elements of this present world that are under the sway of, of uh, Satan. In 23 hundredths of a second, Babylon is destroyed, although the Bible describes it as one hour. Now, that's the perspective of time that you and I stand in right now. 
Okay, so you've got to really look at this thing. Your life may be lived out in minutes and seconds and hours and days and years and weeks and months. And, but really, Psalm 103 is true, that your life is but a vapor. It says a man dies and it's like the flower of the field and the seasons pass and the winds blow over it and no one remembers the place where he once was and no one remembers his name. You're done, you're gone, that's finished. So what do you do with your life right now? And where do you want to put your focus? Where do you want to line up your priorities? What do you think is the important thing? When you look at all the way that you divide your days up, your months, your, your dedications, and you look at all that, if the sum total of it, how much time, and I'm speaking to myself when I say this to you, how much time did you spend on TV? I'm guilty. <laughs> and the rest of you aren't, right? <laughs> How much time did I spend in the martial art? The hours and hours and hours and hours and hours on the practice floor. To do what? To win a few vain trophies? You know, so what? Does anybody remember that I won the U.S. and World Taekwondo Championships? Okay, but you weren't there. <laughs> and it's all gone. Okay, and it's all done. It was a moment, moment of glory. It's finished now. And nobody on planet Earth hardly even cares. I don't even care. Okay, but look at the years that I invested into that. I'm not saying to us that we should just go like, be like hermits and put on the sackcloth and live up in some cave somewhere. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you really need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God, how you're spending your time. That you must be spirit-led now more than ever the way you're spending your time and where you're investing those times, especially now, right now, mm -hmm. as things are getting ready to take place. So these three things are our preservation. This is the weapons that we are going to step into. In this love, truth, and light. Now these three work in a triangular equality together in simultaneous fashion within you. They're, they're, they're separate but they work in concert. Okay, so everything in your relationship with God moves on love, truth, and light. Light is revelation. It's the understanding. It's the expansion of truth. It's the, it's the guidance that you're going to need on point to this generation where you're at right now. No generation has been where we're, we've ever been before. No generation has ever been where we're going. Amen. Not a, do you think that, there, who wrote the manual that we can look back on? You know, who, who, who are our forefathers that we can glean advice from? Nobody. We're unique in the fact that we're the eternal generation. Okay, so we're never going to die from the standpoint that our generation expires and then another generation picks up from us. So these three things are going to work together, and they're absolutely important. In the coming days, knowing God's love, His kingdom, truths, and the revelation of His kingdom... Insights will be the difference between, listen to this, life and death, and even worse, damnation or eternal life in heaven, rewards lost or rewards gained. Now I'm talking about marking the line even from today. This statement is absolutely true right now. So what's this apostasy look like? We'll get into that in just a little bit here. In the coming days, you're in the coming days right now. You're on the precipice of the, of the day of the Lord. And things are going to unfold faster than you can keep up with. In fact, the speed of the darkness, the momentum of the darkness, the vomit of hell upon the face of the earth is going to be so powerful and so strong, it will take everything of Jesus in you to stand and not be persuaded by it. Okay? If you think you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan in the flesh, you are sorely mistaken. He will devour you. You must be walking in the spirit to face that enemy. Amen. And when the moment you put on the self-determination, the moment you come up with a plan, sensible as logical as it may be, but not led by the Holy Spirit, then you're probably going to end up in failure. Everything you're going to do, everything you're going to see, everything that's coming at you, it's going to, you're going to have to battle the supernatural with the supernatural. And Satan is unveiling, without shame, 
The work of the supernatural darkness upon the earth. You're going to see that supernaturalness take place. Right now, the mystery of iniquity is flowing everywhere. Okay, that's what Paul talked about, the mystery of iniquity. How is it that nations around the world and minds and different people and organizations and things, how is it that they seem to be working in one coordinated effort when they don't talk necessarily to each other? It's because they're being guided by the intelligence of a dark spirit. And Satan is, and his minions are orchestrating these things. And in each country, it's unique to itself. In the coming days, knowing God's love, his kingdom truths, and the revelation of his kingdom insights will be the difference between life and death, damnation, or eternal, eternal life in heaven, rewards lost, or rewards gained. And I'll prove this to you here in just a second. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8-10 through 10 says this, And that lawless one who will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, that'll be at the seventh bowl judgment, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, Jesus coming, because he's going to cast him into the lake of fire. Amen. Okay, so Antichrist and the false prophet at the battle of Armageddon, their spirits are literally extracted. The Bible says that their bodies will be buried in the valley of Armageddon. In fact, five months into the millennium, they'll still be burying the dead from that battle. Okay, and there'll be markers everywhere. Where they, where these, I mean, while they're burying the dead, is to, so they can keep up with it. That's how enormous. When Christ slays this army, it's going to look like a forest got blown over, and it's going to be in the in the millions upon millions upon millions that are going to be laying there. Let me go on with this. Okay, that is the one who's coming. Antichrist is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders. And with all deception of wickedness, watch this now, for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth to be saved. Now you look at that very carefully. Why didn't it say because they rejected Jesus? Because they did not receive the love of the truth to be saved. Remember we go back to those three things. Love being the very first one. Light is involved in that. Love, truth, and light. Now, they are handed over because, and watch what happens, this verse 10 is the result of what we've been meeting here every night, every Saturday for calling on the name of the Lord, seeking the name of the Lord, as you have been in your homes, as you have been praying, as you, you carry inside your hearts, that, that waiting for the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to come with such power and such incredible momentum and such force. Watch this now. Watch this. It takes a greater force to, to overcome an opposing force. Yeah. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Okay? So when a force of lawlessness covers the land, it will take a force of righteousness to overcome lawlessness. Yes. Okay? The righteousness has got to be stronger than the lawlessness. The light has got to be stronger than the darkness. The truth has got to be stronger than the deception. Those things are not natural. Those, that's an engaging force. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent, the, the violence that opposes violence, that strong violence will overtake the other violence. And that's where you and I stand right now. The question is, how much strength is in us, how much is in you right now, so that when these things take place, the violence inside you of God's love, of God's light, and of God's truth is going to be stronger than the darkness that opposes you. That's what you have to ask yourself. And it's not automatic. It's something you're going to have to come into, stay with, and stay focused upon. It's something you cannot afford to become entangled with all the affairs of the world and dilute yourself down from your focus in Christ and then think that, okay, now I'm back in again and I'm going to start working real hard again. No, you're behind the eight ball again. You're still behind it. You've lost time. You've misplaced your focus. You're misaligned. You're involved in the things of the world. And so at the end of that, what did you get out of it? Okay? Now watch what happens as we go on. For this love of the truth. For God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says that. We'll go over that verse. And God is light. 1 John 1, 15. This is what the scripture says. And God is truth. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And no man comes unto me except through the Father. I and the Father are one. 
So when you're looking at love, light, and truth, these three things have to be in you. Listen to me. You're going to know whether you're a candidate for the apostasy right now. I'm going to show you nine things that are apparent that if you are in this, these, some of these nine or nine of them, then you are setting up as a candidate for apostasy because you're already stay, taking incremental steps in deviation from the centerline focus of God. We'll look at those in a second here. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> This is a good news message, by the way. It really is in the end. <laughs> Just stay with me, okay? All right. To know God's love is to know God, right? Who is truth. Now, we're going to show you how this works. To know God's truth is to have the light that guides us in these times. So if you don't, to the, let me put it in a different way. To the degree that you know God's love and are practicing it, that's the same proportion, because they're never out of proportion. That is the degree of the truth that you're going to understand about God. If you understand Him who is love, then you'll understand His truth. If you understand His truth, then you'll understand His light, His revelation, His sensitivities. But if you're not a person practicing love, or to the degree that you practice that love, agape love, not the love you're born with, which is phileo, sorte, and eros love. Everybody's born with that. Sorte, love of the relationships. I love my wife differently than I love my dog. She knows that. Hallelujah. I, but it, that's not true with my wife, though. She loves the dog more than she loves me. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Okay. <laughs> But that sorte is a different levels of love, amen? A different relationships of love. The phileo is a love of the mind, and the eros is love of the body. Okay, but what God gives to you when you're saved, and the Holy Spirit comes in, is agape love. Now, that's a resource to you. Okay, everybody has the first three, but only the Christian has the power of God's agape love that's resident in them. So, if, when we know His love, then we know His truth, and then we are walking in the light of that revelation because to walk in his word is to know who he is. It all keeps going back. You can cross it any which way you want, love, light, and truth, any which direction, but they all three work in concert together. All right, follow along with me. Okay, so Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word, which is Lagos, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We sang that this morning in one of the last song. Psalm 119, 114 says, You're my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your rhema word. That's you in the active place. If you ever get a chance, I would encourage you to do it today because you won't be able to stop reading it once you start. Sit down and just read Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the, in the, in the Bible. But read that and look at the... I mean, it, it's amazing to, to read. And all the interaction that God has for you in that. Okay? Now follow along with me what we're doing here. Okay, so 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Now here's how you know whether you're walking in God's love. Look at it, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Okay, let us agape one another, for agape is from God. For everyone who is, a, who is agape, oh, it's the... the Verb tense of agape is born of God and knows God. The one who does not agapeo, practice that love, does not know God, for God is love. So you can't say that you know God in the intimate sense if you're not practicing the love that He gave to you as the source and the resource inside of you. Are you with me on that? Okay, you follow what I'm saying? Now watch. If I love Jesus, if I love Him as you love Him, then we have to ask ourselves this question. To love what God loves and to hate what God hates. Amen? Now this is the mystery of our generation. Okay, and don't take this the wrong way. I don't know how you can be a Democrat and love God because of what they stand for. Amen. Now, I'm not saying the Republicans are much better. Okay. Okay. I'm not saying that either. Okay. But, but it's very obvious when you talk about LGBTQ and all the different things and all the transgenderism and all the, the surgical mutilation that takes place and all the, the laws that support those kinds of things. Abortion. abortion all that, the platforms of that are lopsided to one party. 
Okay, but that's the echo of the political persuasion of the darkness that's coming along. Now, if you love God, you have to hate what God hates. Right? I mean, if you're going to be following in the love of God, how can you love God and, and love what He hates and still have that together? If you don't like my, my wife, I don't like you. Okay? That's just the way that works. Amen? Because we're in covenant relationships. So when... If you love what I love, then we're, we're bonded closer together. And the thing that we all love together here is Jesus that puts us all together as one family. Amen. And then what we do, what do we love after that? We love His Word. And by loving His Word, we love His truth. And if we love His truth, then we have the revelation that ever expands continually in us. And it only takes us in one direction toward the clarity of God's character. Now, if I love Jesus, guess who I'm going to have to love with Jesus? That which He loves. And that's you. Okay? That means I love you. Okay, honest and truly, that's what that means. I, there's no place I would rather be on a Sunday than right here. I mean, I could probably be wiggling my toes, you know, doing something else. I could be, but there's going to be a piece of me that's missing because I will be wherever I'm at doing, but not completely there because this is where I would rather be. This is where my completeness is. It's in the body of Christ. But if you've lost the feeling for the local body, it's testimony that you've lost the feeling. You've dro dropped down in your measure of your love for God. Don't kid yourself. You can't have it both ways. Okay? You follow me? You can't have it both ways. You cannot love the things of the world and ignore the things of God at the same time. Can't do it. It doesn't work. You can do whatever you want to do with that, but you're going to come up with a math that doesn't work. Amen? To love God is to love what He loves. My obligation to you, not because I am a pastor in this church, but because because I'm here because I want to be here, not because I have to be here. Amen. I'm here because I love this body. Now, I love the body of Christ, okay, but I don't have any tangible connection to the rest of the body of Christ. All right, I have friends in Ghana, Africa, I have friends in Kenya, I have friends over in, in Liberia and I different nations that I've been to. We support this orphanage over in Pakistan and the 17 children that are in there. We, but I've never met those people. I don't have tangibility to them. I have connection in the spirit, but I don't have tangibility to them. Where do I have a visible, tangible expression where that love becomes real, it's in the local body. And if I withhold that from the local body, then I have to say, do I really care, do I really love what Jesus loves? Amen. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Okay, so that's our obligation to one another. If we love God, then we love each other, because that's what the scripture says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Well, love isn't just something that's a philosophy. It's not just an attitude. It's an action point. There is something that I do to interact with you so that I can encourage you in the love of Christ. And not just because I stand in a position of ministry, but that so you encourage me, I encourage you. We hang out. We do things together. I meet with Pastor Jay almost every week. And we talk. And we have fellowship, kononia. And we talk about everything. He's a better shot at bird hunting, I can tell you that, than I would be. <laughs> I've learned, well, I don't know. <laughs> he went out pheasant hunting, three shots, three birds. I told him if I was with him, we'd still be out in the field. <laughs> it's just the way it rolls. <laughs> but we, we need each other, and that we need to be exercising the love of God into each other's life. That's what the scripture says. So let us not neglect. Another scripture will say forsake. Let us not neglect the gathering of ourselves together as some have done in these last days. Are we in the last days? Yes, that's part of the apostasy for those who are neglecting the body. Because they are departing from the intensity that, of God's love and they are handing it out to whatever else they're doing. Let us not neglect the gathering of ourselves together as some have done in these last days, but all the more encouraging one another in love. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You may have had a tough week. 
Okay? But that's why I'm here, if I didn't have as tough a week. I mean, I just got a phone call from a brother this morning. Can you bring us something to eat? I said, yes, I'll be more than honored to do that as soon as church is over. Because they're sick. That's what the body's about. That's what we do for each other. Let me go on with this, okay? The apostasy is right now. It is right now, folks. And we have to understand that it's not, this is the last days. We're at the verge of the seals of Revelation opening. We're not very far away. So the apostasy is going on right now. You're targeted for apostasy by the enemy, okay? And Satan's got his mark on you. Well, so does Jesus, as a matter of fact. Okay, so if things start getting messed up, it's because there's a scrimmage between Jesus and Satan over your life. Only the wisdom of Jesus is infinite and Satan is limited. So guess who's smarter? Okay? And guess who's going to win? Jesus. Uh, he is if you cast the vote toward him. He will if you cast the vote toward him and you yield to him. All right? You're, if you're less focused on God than you were six months ago or a year ago, if you're less focused today than you were even weeks and months ago, then you're being targeted right now. Because that is a process going in a direction. Are you less focused than you were before? I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about the fuzzy little warm feelings in your heart. I'm talking about things that have a provable, tangible connection. If you're cooling in your agape love, how do I know if I'm cooling in the agape love of God? That's an interesting question. Let me show you something here. That is, I'm, I don't have this on the slides. Here's what Paul said. It's in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. You've all read this so many times, you know it. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, agape, I become a noising gong and a clanging cymbal. Okay, now watch. He's talking about interventions, intersections of the supernatural into our lives, okay? We speak in the tongue of men and angels. So this morning we had a, a gift called the speaking in tongues. And then who gave the, who gave the, uh, Tito, was that you that, who, who yeah. gave, you gave the interpretation, okay? It was a great interpretation, by the way. Um, so we had a tongue and we had an interpretation, now, the tongue was a display of the supernatural, but we needed to hear the interpretation so that we could apply that tongue to our life. And that happened to be what the interpretation came for us. Amen? Amen. So now we're, we're edified. Now watch this. And if I had the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, not some mysteries, but all, okay, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, not some, but all, all knowledge, all things. He's using extremes here is what he's doing. All prophecy, all mysteries, all knowledge, all faith. So as to remove mountains, every obstacle, everything that would stand in your way. That's, I, if you can do that, I want to be your friend. Okay? And do not have love, I'm nothing. Now stop and think about this. I had a friend that I had came and visited us one time in ministry. Within minutes of picking this person up at the airport, he spoke over my daughter's life, over her friend, and over my son. Things that well-known prophets had spoken over their lives before, including Dick Mills. He spoke exactly the things that had been spoken over their lives. He looked at my wife, and this is all within minutes, and said... That thing in your arm is going to have to be taken care of. He had no idea that she had a titanium plate in her arm from a head-on collision by a drunk driver that killed her friend in the car with her. And he couldn't have known that in, in, in but just a few minutes standing there. And he would call people's names out, first names, and then speak a word of knowledge over their life. Signs, wonders, miracles, and healings were taking place. I have pictures of the, of the canes and the crutches and everything else there. And then one day I get a phone call from another friend says, we've got to go over to um, um, Kansas City and we've got to help our friend. I said, what's going on? He goes, he needs some help. Same man that spoke all these prophecies, these words. He, had, he was having 30 sexual affairs with women in his church. 30 sexual affairs with women in his church. 
And you're going, how in the world could a person operate in those gifts and yet be bankrupt on the fruits of the Spirit? And because they work independently. Amen. And the reason why they work independently is because God can't find a perfect vessel that, except in Jesus Christ for any of the gifts to work. Okay, so you never, ever, ever, ever judge your standing. You don't judge your spiritual standing. You don't judge your strength by your gifts. You always judge them by the fruits. The fruit of the Spirit is what you give to God. Gifts is what He gives to you. And He can make donkeys talk. So don't get too high-minded. <laughs> Amen. So he says, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now you stop and you think the sacrifices that are all there. Think about that. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It does not brag. It's not arrogant. Now listen to me, because those are internal preserving mechanisms of God. That's what those are. They're internal preserving. Watch this. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not selfish. It doesn't, it's not provoked. It does not take into account wrong suffered. Those are all internal preservations inside you. So that when the enemy attacks from the outside, when he tries to offend you, when he tries to lodge something in you that makes you angry, you don't act unbecomingly. And when he tries to throw something at you so that you don't harbor an offense, so that unforgiveness can't find its nesting. So that bitterness can't drop its root. Yes. And so if you have the love of Christ in you, when those attacks come to you, they're repelled from you because of God's love upon you and how God's love is operating in you. So that power of that love keeps you in that place of the perfect will of God, walking in the laser line with the Lord. It's the love operating in before you've said anything or done anything for anybody. It's that love of God. Now, because that love is in you, then it begins to affect other people from you. Therefore, love, does, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, now watch this. How can I say that I love you and then disappear? For weeks at a time. How can I say I do that? How can, how, can, how can a husband say to his wife, I love you, and then he's just gone for week after week after week? Uh, you can't. Because love compels closeness. If you love God, you're close to God. If you're close to God, then you're close to the things the way God directs you. Amen? Okay, so this talks about now body ministry one to another. We love one another. If I love you, how can I withhold myself from you? How can I come just float in and float out? I'm here, I'm gone. I might be here, I might not be here. Is that an expression of agape love flowing from me to you? I don't, don't think of me in my position as a pastor. Think of me as in my position in the body. How we're all to encourage one another. So if I keep disappearing on you all the time, and then I show up strong, and then I disappear, what's going on? Is that the practice of God's love in me? No, that's not. That is not. I've traded that out. Okay, I've dropped, I've dropped that intensity of God's love down here so that I can give my affections to something over here. It goes that way. You can't have it both ways. Paul warned Timothy, don't become entangled in the things of this world and still think that you can serve him who enlisted you into the kingdom. So you've got to make a choice in these days ahead whether or not you're going to walk in the love of God and faithful dedication to one another in the days ahead or if you're going to take this real casual, because that means that your love with God is as casual as your outward demonstration of God's love. You can't have an intense love for God and a casual demonstration of God's love. It doesn't work that way. So you have to make choices, don't you? You have to choose what you're going to do. But you can't have it both ways. And don't be fooled. People will see it and they'll notice it. So are you cooling in your agape love? 
Are you less connected to his word? Well, whatever you're giving your time to in someplace else, you're going to have to give up the time in the word. What you say yes to no, one thing is no to another. Keep in mind that you can't say yes to all things because they, they are counterproductive one to the other. So you're going to have to pick and choose what you're saying yes to. Amen? The apostasy is now. Are you too entangled in this life? Too entangled in your pleasures? Too entangled in your likes? Too entangled in your affections? Too entangled in your involvements? What are they that entangle you, that pull you away from the primary focus of Christ, of His body, of His word, of His love, of His truth, of His light? What are you entangled with? Now, I'm not saying to you that there are things that come up that you, that you can't, that you're just going to have to burn the fort anyway. I'm not saying that to you. There's a balance to everything I'm saying. There is a balance to that. Amen? If I had a family emergency in Boise and I couldn't make it on a Sunday, I know you'd understand. Amen? But I don't have a family emergency every weekend in Boise. I don't have a family emergency five weeks in a row in Boise. And then I come back floating in again. I don't have that. There's a difference. It's balance that you're talking about. So if you're going to say that you walk in the love of God, and those descriptions that we see, the self-internal preser preservations of love, that keep us from having offenses, that keep us from unforgiveness, and keep us from bitterness, and then I have to also say, well, how can I serve my brother and sister in Christ? Well, I can't if I'm not connected to you. I can't do it. Are your priorities, your priorities are misaligned. In other words, you've got to choose what you're going to be doing. Especially now. If you were in the days of Thessalonians, you know where you'd be, you know you'd be ministering at? Not in the public street. Mm -mm. You know where you'd be? You'd be in the catacombs of Rome. The catacombs where they excavated the soil and they made the bricks for the city. And then you would go down into the catacombs and there would be an address in those catacombs, you know, four pillars down, three pillars to the left, two pillars straight down again, two pillars to the right. And that's where we're meeting tonight for church. You wouldn't just have a casual entry and a casual exit in church all the time. You wouldn't have that. And the days are coming when that, you're not going to be able to do that either. I had to do uh, some property recovery one time and do a sting operation in Independence, Missouri. And I went to the police department there, befriended some police officers who helped me on the case. And while I was there, they gave me a tour of the salt mines. It's amazing, the salt mines that are over there that are just incredible. And I think he told me, if I'm not too mistaken here, 200 miles worth of crisscrossing intersections in the salt mines. And you can drive 18 wheelers in this, these, these corridors that go down there. And so he took me through. I had no idea where I was at. And he goes, yeah, he says, a lot of times, he says, we have so much crime inside the salt mines. And the high school and the students will come over there and they'll have massive parties. And they know exactly how to tell everybody. The word will get around in the high school how to get to the party under the salt mine. He says, and, and we'll drive in there for a whole shift and try to find it. We can't. <laughs> Well, that's what's going to happen in the days coming. You're going to, this is not going to be open like this. Your love for one another is, is actually going to be very cohesive. If there will be no casual introduction into the body of Christ because for a stranger to come in that has no affinity or relationship with you is to bring a death sentence of captivity or you know, like it is in China right now. Let me give you the sixth one here. Okay, your revelation is stale. You're not increasing in the knowledge of God. You're just feeding on old stuff. And you need to be increasing at all times in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. You need to be discovering things all the time. If you're walking in your love for God, that relationship of intimacy, and you sit down and you read the Word, there's revelation, that's the light that's going to become leaping off of the pages of God's Word to you. You're going to see things coming together. Okay, let's go to the last three. You have less tolerance for truth. You don't like this message. You don't like to hear that. That's too tough. That's, that's too direct. It seems like this is, you know, a word that, that is uncomfortable. Yep, 
That's right. If the truth isn't messing with you, then you probably are not hearing the truth. Because as I last looked, I'm not perfected yet. And neither are you. That means I have a whole lot of truth that's still got to be exposing to me so that I can start coming into a conviction, feeling a little uncomfortable with that, and then come into a repentance so that I can align more to the intensity of God's Word. So if truth is not, if what's being preached is not making you squirm, it's very likely that you're not getting the truth that you need that is an encounter to the area that needs to change. So it's important. Truth is not easy. Jesus said that. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. What was that sword? It was truth. In other words, here's the order. It's spirit first, blood second, water third. In other words, if you have to choose between spirit and blood, that is family and Jesus, you always choose Jesus. If you have to choose between family and friends, which is water, you always choose family. So it's friends, family, God. But God always stays number one. And that's the power of the truth that he's talking about. Okay, you are indifferent to warnings. In other words, when something is said to you, then it's just cranial diarrhea. In one ear and out the other. It doesn't stay, it doesn't register, it doesn't affect you, it doesn't impact you, it doesn't change you, it doesn't do anything. Okay, that means that you're indifferent to the warnings that are given by the Spirit of God. And the last one is your love for the saints is cooling. You can live for suspended periods of time without interaction to the saints. The family, you don't miss the family. You wonder about them, but you don't really miss them. You, you don't miss them with enough motivation to make the sacrifice to be in the fraternity of the family. The thing that happens when I'm overseas is that I miss my wife the instant that I walk out the door. But I love Jesus more, and I'm going to serve Christ because it's spirit first, then blood, then family, then water. But I, I miss my wife while I'm gone. It's not, it's not fun, but I'm serving at the greater truth. Watch this. That means that there's sacrifices that you and I have to make. Okay? It means that I have to set aside personal desires, wants, hobbies, everything else. That that comes second to my preference, to, what, to my love of God, and to do the things that he, that he would have of me to do in love to the body of Christ. Those are difficult words to say sometimes. Because we're in a period, and if you were in Africa, this would not be anything hard to say at all. Because if I were standing in a mud-walled, thatched roof village, there's no bicycles, clocks, there's no toys, there's no cars, there's nothing, nothing. You get up in the morning and you go to the agricultural fields and you come back and then the, you fraternize with family to, and people together. And you, you, everybody's got this little clay pot oven that sits outside of their little thatched mud wall house that's dirt floor. And they make whatever food they gathered that day. And they have almost like we would have, see on 4th of July, we're having picnics and we're fraternizing with each other. And then when church comes along, it's the best thing that's happened all week. Amen. Because they have no conflicts. Not so in a first world country. As I told some Africans, it's harder to be a Christian in America than it is in Africa. Because you don't have to worry about all the toys. You don't have distractions and your affections and your, for everything else that you want to do. You don't have that. Without God's love increasing in you by His truth and by His light, one, you lose spiritual preservation. So now you're susceptible to offense. Now you're susceptible when someone says something you didn't like to hear. And now it lodges in you. And then it starts to roll in you. And instead of seeing the truth through God's love, or the love through God's truth, now all that's happening is that you're getting clanged on in your soul where the love of God is not ruling. And so now you're offended. And, then the, and what's happening it's the assassination of seduction by the enemy to move you in further and further away from that central truth of God. You, in, the, you cease spiritual growth. Love is the operation of God's love in you compels you in spiritual growth. To know God's love is to know Him. 
To know him is to compel you, is to draw you, is to motivate you into his word and into his word to guide you. And everything equates to increasing in spiritual love. How is it that a man like Paul could do all that he did? Who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who in his day, mostly by foot and horseback and some by, by ship or boat, went over 10,000 miles in the gospel. And the whole area of his domain was fully preached in that time by Paul and by those disciples he raised up. How did a man do that? How is it that he was beaten five times where Jesus had one time 39 stripes? He was hit five times like that. How is it that he was stoned to death in Iconia or Lister or Derb and gets up and goes right back in and preaches again? How did he do all that? How did he, what was he thinking when he was hanging on the driftwood in the middle of the ocean? What was he thinking for a day and a night hanging in the deep in the Mediterranean? What was Jonah thinking when he was over by Tarshish, which is by Spain? That's at the opening at the end where the Atlantic ends and it starts to open up into the Mediterranean Sea. And Nineveh's all the way across linear Mediterranean to, to Assyria. And the fish swallowed him. You want to know what a three-day journey across the Mediterranean is? Like inside of a whale's belly? Someone ought to write a book on that one. Because he would have been able to. It wasn't just a little swallow and a burp. I mean, he's there as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Three days, he's in a whale. Going to, and that whale is beelining it from Tarshish straight through. It's nonstop. Here you go, buckle up, folks. We'll be ending in Tarshish with a good vomit in a minute here. And then out into the shore he goes. <laughs> That was the first record of a cruise in the Mediterranean <laughs> that we have in Scripture. <laughs> Number three is that, are you a candidate for apostasy? Now, folks, we have to take this thing serious. And we have to be aware of the things that are happening and what God is doing. And, and how, as I said, everything in the Bible is an understatement. Every single thing is. And when God says something little, it means big. When God says, walk in love, little do we realize it's, it's the preservation of our life. It's what keeps me able to ward off the darts of the enemy so that I'm not offended, so that I don't carry the pain from one thing into the next. So I don't carry the offense from one thing into the next. You, have you, I know we have this expression, water on a duck's back, but has anybody ever seen water roll off a duck's back? Mm -hmm. Oh man, let me tell you what, it's like you just got done waxing the hood of your car. I mean, it just beads up and it's gone. That duck doesn't even have to shake. It can sit there in a rainstorm and the water just falls off the duck. And when we're walking in the love of God, and we're practicing the agape love of God. And we're filling with the word of God and the light of God. Here's what we're in. We're in the environment right now. Right now. Where the Lord says lawlessness will increase and the love of many will grow cold. Okay? Follow with me on that? Okay, so in other words, if you don't put on the armor of God's love and you're surrounded by lawlessness, you are prone to offense cynicism. And cynicism is a different form of offense. So what is cynicism? I hate the government. I don't trust the government. I don't either. <laughs> but I don't let it get down into me, okay? So I just look, that's the government. But I'm not going to wear the cynicism. It's not going to find its way into me where I have a soured look. You know, and that's what happens to cops all the time. Career cops are cynical people. Yep. I know because I was a career cop. And after I retired, you know what? 
I'm walking in Safeway and I'm doing groceries. I'm going, who's shoplifting in here? You know, I did. And I would always catch people shoplifting on, on payday, you know. And I, here I am, I'm arresting people when I should be shoplifting. I mean, when I should be shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. <laughs> okay, block that out of your minds. <laughs> but, the, okay, so I can see you're not cynical, you're too happy, but... <laughs> But that's what happens when you, you get focused on something negative all the time. You sit in a restaurant, you don't want your back to the, to the, to the entry of the restaurant. You just start to develop a mentality. You know, you're driving your car and you see someone do something stupid and you go, I wish I, was, I wish I had my ticket can with me. You know, and everything is a cynical view. And it takes a while to purge that from your system. But if you're walking in the love of Christ, it never finds its root. It can't grab you, can't take you, can't hold you. Why? Because we're not citizens of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. So we're to be the light, the love, the salt, the ambassadorship of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. And for me to do that, I have to be in the love of Jesus Christ. I have to be speaking God's word in love. Strict as it may sound, straight as it may be, I have to speak God's word in love. If I don't, then I'll speak God's word in anger, and it'll come out as judgment. It'll come out absent of the character of God. It'll come out like a battering ram. It'll come out as judgmental against you. But if I'm speaking God's love in truth, then you want the word of the Spirit and the Spirit of the word together. And then if I say something to you that calls to mind a place where you need to correct something in your Christian walk, and I'm saying it to you in love, it's easier for you to receive than if I take you to the corner and beat you like the red-headed red middle child until finally you confess, you're right, you're right. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way God works in His kingdom. Amen? So, as we go forward in these days coming up, this is so interesting. You're going to have to take and look at Psalm 113, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 113, uh, 13. Look at Psalm uh, Corinthians 13. Study that love chapter. Ask yourself if you're walking in the love of God. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself if the words you're speaking and the actions that you're taking are God's love. Do you think it was strange and weird that Judas was among the twelve? You know what it is? Listen, it's a picture that among the saints are, there are those, sad to say, who will fall into the apostasy and depart from Christ. Sitting among the saints today. That will happen. Could it happen to me, you say? No. You'll have, to res you'll have to fight against the love of Christ. It'll be very, very difficult for you to do that. But you have a will in what you're going to choose to do. And if you'll start practicing those little tiny things, the half a step, a compromise, the half a step, Ignoring this part of the truth, ignoring the next part of the truth. Before you know it, the further and further you get from the central point of Christ, the cooler and cooler you get, until finally you get to this thing called past feeling. And your sensitivity levels to the Holy Spirit are gone. And now what's left is an academic knowledge of God, and the heart connection is severed. And you'll have all those, farm, those warm little, you know, cushy little things in your heart. You'll remember those kind of things. You'll acknowledge them. You won't deny them. But neither will you live them. So ask yourself in a personal inventory. Ask yourself now. 
Where are you making compromises that are not parallel to the standard of God's Word? Where are you taking liberties that are not in your life, in your personal life, and toward the body of Christ? Where are you taking liberties that are rational, excusable, that really aren't in the central point? Now listen to this carefully. Not in the central point with where we're at now in the timeline of this generation. What you could do 20 years ago is what you cannot do today. What you could do 10 years ago, you cannot do today. What you did 5 years ago, you cannot do today. Now, you have to start saying, what am I going to choose? I cannot be entangled in the things of this earth. And serve him who called me in righteousness in Christ. You can't do it. You cannot do it. The day is coming when you will not have casual access to the body of Christ. And then, where will you re-intersect into that? Let me tell you something in a spiritual law. There are no shortcuts. You can't circumvent anything in the body of Christ in your growth. Where you leave off is where you have to re-enter. You can't circumvent and come back over in a different place five years later, two years later, three months later. You can't do it. Where you leave off is where you have to re-enter. So all that is lost time. How much revelation do you miss? How much impartation do you miss? How much in the move of the Spirit of God that's in the saints, how much of it do you miss? Because there are things that are God, that God is doing in the congregation He is not going to do with you personally. Because He needs the plurality of the saints to do that with. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, so in the, when the plurality of the saints are coming together, that is not replaceable. You can't regain that in your personal prayer closet. The uniqueness of what happens with you and God in your prayer closet is one thing, but the uniqueness of what God does in the congregation of saints is another. And when you go into a famine mode with your interactions in the body of Christ, then you are hurting yourself and delaying your steps. And you have to come back in where you left off. And believe me, you don't just show up and then you're there. This isn't Star Trek, beam me up Scotty. Amen? Yeah. So keep that in mind as we go forward into those things in Christ. The power of the greatest weapon that we possess is God's love. That's the power. That's the most violent weapon. It's God's love. If that love is in you, you're unstoppable. And as that love increases in you, you are unstoppable. And you'll go right through the enemy, throwing everything he can at you, and you'll, it'll just stay off of you. Amen? Why don't you take the hand of the person there next to you?